Okay, now let's move into the first panel of the day, the introductory panel, uh, current measures in urban bird management in Singapore. Uh, I will hand it over to Anbu to moderate the panel and also invite all speakers to turn on your videos. Thank you. A reminder to drop your questions for any of the panel speakers in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your Zoom window. Thank you, uh, Jocelyn, and uh, also Geraldine. It's very exciting to share about the Urban Bird Ambassador uh, team. Um, it's a very important team, so I welcome, encourage you all to either sign up or even share amongst your friends who are interested. Um, so let's start with the panel one. I would like to invite um, our first speaker, Jocelyn Cheng, whom you have all uh, met. And uh, Jocelyn works with our Acres Wildlife Management team. Uh, with many years of experience as an educator, Jocelyn is happy to bring that to her role in conducting outreach to the public on the topic of human wildlife coexistence. Um, she, alongside with another wildlife management executive at Acres, uh, they are always on the ground talking to public, educating them, and also um, advising them on ways to mitigate human wildlife conflict situations. Uh, she enjoys bird watching and uh, seeing urban birds go about their activities brings cheer to her daily life. So welcome, Jocelyn. Okay, thank you, Ambu. So hi again. And uh, yes, I will be sharing a little bit about urban bird management efforts uh, in Singapore that we've been, that we are aware of uh, and our, that our team in Acres has been working on as well. So just very a very quick introduction, uh, uh, like what Andrew mentioned, I am from the wildlife management team at Acres, and we are the team that helps to mitigate possible human wildlife conflicts and to promote coexistence with wild animals uh, through outreach, through um, sessions like this, forums, workshops. Uh, yeah, so at this point, um, I would like to ask, uh, get a sense, sensing in the room of your, of the perception that we have of urban birds. So just take a few minutes, few seconds to uh, indicate what you would like to choose. You can choose more than one option. Okay, I think we have most of the answers. Wow. Okay, so uh, interesting um, that uh, yeah, I'm just looking at, at what we have. Uh, quite a lot of us do understand, uh, realize that they are part of the ecosystem. 36% uh, of us feel that they are cute. <laughs> okay, very nice. So like what I'm wish at just now, very endearing. Me. Um, some of us tolerate them and, and some of us uh, also feel that they are pests. Yeah, and that's quite, um, I, you know, it's, it's a, I guess, commonly held view as well, right? So, okay, interesting. Uh, and that, that helps, that's very good to, to uh, kind of inform our discussions moving forward for today. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to just start by uh, touching on the root cause of urban bird issues. I think Geraldine has already also talked about it. But essentially, um, you know, as you can see in the pictures, it's always uh, to do with feeding, either direct or indirect, right? So what we mean, or rather food provision. So what we mean by indirect food provision is something like um, the picture on the left, you know, where birds are able to get food uh, from trash, from uh, food centers, and so on. Uh, direct is direct provision is when people directly feed birds, right? And I think we have we have some questions as well about. Um, yeah, the reasons that that uh that for pe for people to feed um, birds. Um, what happens? So basically, what happens when uh there's 
a lot of easy access to food, right, for, for the urban birds. Um, it helps them to be really successful, helps them to be more successful, helps them to reproduce more and also congregate more around the uh, areas where they can get food. So that often leads to negative uh, feedback about birds, right? And when the negative feedback starts to pile up, very often for pigeons, uh, one of the measures that is done to control the population is um, poisoning. Uh, and you might have seen some exercises going on uh, around your neighborhoods. So usually a contractor is called in to do this exercise uh, and they are fed with the poison bait. Uh, and essentially the drug um, causes them to lose their uh, motor functions. So they'll be, I can, as you can see in the video, uh, they might uh, have some spasms. They will be semi-conscious or unconscious. So what happens is that uh, then the contractors will collect these semi-conscious pigeons and kill them using carbon dioxide gas. Okay, yeah, so essentially you can see what's happening here with the atom that pigeons actually go through from this experience. Okay, uh, there's, there are other measures as well for uh, controlling the pigeon, uh, controlling crow population. So usually that's done by trapping. Uh, you might have seen again uh, traps like this set up in your neighborhood. So similarly, uh, to encourage a food bait is put in the trap to encourage the crows to go in. A, often from observation, you know, we are not sure how effective such a uh, such an exercise is because very few crows actually do get uh, successfully trapped. Yeah. So we will also um, touch more on the ineffectiveness of of trapping and uh, using poison. Yeah. Um, but moving on to other measures that are uh, in place. So often you might see in different neighborhoods, standees, very colorful, uh, eye-catching signs, right? Uh, to encourage people not to feed uh, birds. So such as, I think you have seen these around. More examples. Uh, in This was a short, uh, short-term project done by Tampanese Town Council. Uh, it was very interesting because they actually include uh, the include quotes from residents, which you know really helps to reach out to the to people around. It really helps to uh, kind of make it more, uh, more, more, more human and more you know endearing, right? Uh, and but also to let people know what their neighbors are, are feeling and thinking, uh, and and it shares the complaints that were received. So you know it's like kind of, it's it's really on the ground and getting uh, everyone's buy into, you know, uh, let's try to work together to reduce complaints, right? You may notice that the fine uh, is uh, outdated. So this was a few years ago. So the current fine is actually $5,000 for the first, for a first time feeding offense and up to 10,000 for subsequent offenses. Moving on to other measures uh, that are more structural and uh, design based. So uh, you, again, very often at the at food centers, you may have noticed netting uh, that to prevent birds from flying in. Uh, however, sometimes uh, it's not very completely done. So uh, like you can see with the picture of the miner on top, uh, there is a gap that actually the miner can still access, can still fly in. Yeah. Uh, bird spikes as well uh, to prevent birds from perching, from being able to uh, stand around for a long time and observe and, and swoop in to get food, right? So all those uh, measures that I've mentioned are basically um, in general, what you may have, what you, you are likely to see uh, very often in the different neighborhoods. Uh, just moving on to share uh, from Acres' wildlife management team, the efforts that we have been doing as well. So from, uh, sorry, last year in October, 2021, we actually wrote a letter and appeal uh, together with SPCA, uh, to all MPs in Singapore, uh, to encourage them to end the practice of pigeon poisoning. So, you know, uh, I'm going to elaborate a little bit more so you can see uh, a little bit small, but the highlighted uh, sections where we we uh, we uh, we actually wrote, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, given certain certain uh, scientific uh, evidence why food provision is actually um, the root cause, right? And it's as long as food provision remains uh, in the neighborhood, culling is not going to be effective because it's going to actually just, uh, you remove some uh, small number of the birds and 
they uh, can the, the, there's more there's the same amount of food available for actually a fewer number of birds. So that means that the they can be more successful. So uh, we are we encourage the town the MPs and the town councils to instead of using poisoning, which is not effective, uh, move towards you uh, encouraging uh, the, re the people to reduce you know the direct and indirect food provision. So uh, work, look into focus campaigns instead uh, to target and address direct and indirect food provision, which is uh, the root cause as mentioned earlier. So following up from that letter, uh, we met with several town councils who responded positively. Uh, and uh, those were very interesting and very fruitful discussions with the different uh, uh, well, MP level as well as the staff of the town councils who are keen to put in place more humane me measures. Yeah, uh, we were also invited to share with some coffee shop owners uh, in Bisun Town Council. So there, the coffee shops were going to undergo renovation and uh, so we, uh, we, we were invited to give some ideas on how uh, design-wise we could, uh, our, our, the, the coffee shops could kind of pre help, help to minimize the excess of food to birds. Um, we also worked with Nian Podi. So uh, they had a civic intern program uh, where a team of students actually did a project to engage senior citizens on the ground regarding seeding. So I will not elaborate uh, a lot here because we have a further panelist, uh, Noreen, who will talk more about this later. Uh, so the basic stuff, we also obviously have advisories, both video uh, and um, uh, image pictures, uh, posters. Uh, so we have, ICLAS One Animation team has a whole series of coexistence videos uh, that the uh, snapshot of the playlist uh, is on the right. But uh, we have also recently completed filming the one on pigeons. So encouraging again, humane measures, no feeding, uh, the usual advice. And um, no introduction needed to, no further introduction needed to this because uh, Geraldine has already uh, shared with you. So yeah, we are hoping to launch this in order to really more intensively target uh, the, the root cause of urban bird issues. Okay, so uh, I've reached the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. And I will hand it back to Anbo. Thanks a lot, uh, Jocelyn, uh, for sharing uh, very comprehensively the ongoing efforts from different angles, um, whether it's habitat modification or uh, direct interference at animal level, and also the education enforcement efforts. Um, I would like to invite our second speaker, uh, Ati Sankar, who is the executive director of the SPCA. With more than uh, 10 years of experience in bridging the public and private sector through well-designed engagement strategies and partnerships, Ati focuses on building greater community partnerships so as to continue advocating for a more compassionate society for all the sentient beings. So glad to have you, Ati. Uh, welcome to start your sharing session. Hi, Amber. Thank you so much. Um, are you able to see my slides? Yes, we can. Awesome. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking time off on a weekend. I know that it's not easy uh, as we always have a lot of commitments on a Sunday. Uh, but the turnout really, you know, proves that urban animal issues are something that we really need to address. Uh, at the same time, you know, I just want to share a little bit more about the SPCA as well. Uh, so the SPCA Singapore, you know, um, exists to promote kindness towards animals and prevent cruelty towards animals. Uh, while our general focus has always been on companion animals such as dogs, cats, hamsters and rabbits and guinea pigs, uh, our advocacy work actually extends far beyond that and we often work with other partners such as Acres uh, to continue the advocacy work as well. Uh, so today I'll be sharing a little bit more about, you know, how intricately interconnected community animals and the urban popu bird population are. So a lot of us know already that humans and animals are very well connected um, and a lot of these issues actually impact one another. Uh, so for example, you know, we can see how important animal health is in terms of uh, improving uh, human well-being and also how human actions can sometimes impact the welfare and well-being of community animals. Uh, but at the same time, it is also vital for us to know that animal well-being is interconnected between species as well. Uh, so sometimes, you know, uh, what happens to one group of animals could 
uh, incredibly impact another uh, groups, group of animals' welfare as well. Uh, so what I want to share is that, you know, regardless of our leanings and our passion, you know, uh, you might feel very strongly for one group of animals. It's important to understand that, you know, uh, at the end of the day, they're all interconnected and all animal lives matter. So these are some of the pertinent issues that have been raised in the last few years. Um, and you would realize that, you know, very often our community animals and our urban animals coexist. And because of that, um, the way we feed them or the way we trap or the way we actually try to control their population could impact another group of animals. Some of the key issues that we see uh, first are community feeding. Uh, so how we actually feed our animals, uh, like our dogs and our cats could impact uh, the population of birds we see as well as rodents. Uh, the second is also, you know, peaceful coexistence between community animals. As you can see on the right, uh, you know, there were some instances of how, you know, stray dogs have actually attacked cats as well. And the last is really in terms about population control measures and how we really need to understand that uh, we have to take a risk-based and holistic approach towards whichever method that we choose. So today I'll be focusing primarily on two key issues, the first being community animal feeding, and the second would be a little bit more about population control measures and the impact they might have on the larger animal population. So as you know, feeding community dogs and cats is legal in Singapore, uh, unlike feeding of birds and wildlife. Uh, however, at the same time, I'd like to remind people that littering is not, and you know, we have to ensure that we maintain a general cleanliness when we actually uh, execute such actions. Uh, irresponsible feeding can often lead to the proliferation of urban animal populations. And when this happens, you know, it uh, often causes a rise in complaints. Uh, and once these complaints come in, it might actually sway or persuade authorities to take on more extreme forms of inhumane population control methods. So if you are a community animal feeder or if you care you know, about the stray animals that you might see in your own estates, uh, it's very important to first take note to um, you know, ensuring proper measures when we actually feed them. Uh, so this could include you know, ensuring that we do not leave open sources of food uh, or we feed directly on the ground because often there will be remnants that might actually attract other animals. So often use, uh, always use paper plates, bowls or newspaper to feed and make sure that we clean this up after the general, uh, all the feeding is done. Uh, so this doesn't just mean the newspaper but also ensure that you look around, you make sure that every place is clean. Uh, we also advise people not to feed at high traffic areas or at people's corridors or the living spaces as well because uh, our community animals are very very intelligent they know you know after a few rounds of feeding to come back to that particular location so you might be you know comfortable with feeding but uh, your neighbors may not be and that might actually you know result in them complaining to the authorities to remove the community animals as well uh, I think the more important thing is also that we need to be able to communicate and you know adopt facilitation when we speak to people who maybe are feeding in a different manner that might not be so healthy uh, or, you know, who are feeding animals beyond just community animals as well. Uh, so I think this is a long process. You know, I know that a lot of the questions that are coming in today are also about how do we really engage this group of people. I think we'll share a bit more about it later. And at the same time, we want to hear other people's perspectives of it. It's also important, don't throw food out of your windows when you want to feed a community animal, uh, because, you know, this will always attract birds and other animals as well to come in. Uh, work closely with other community feeders. Uh, often the SPCA, you know, we receive feedback, you know, uh, of different feeders within one estate. So it's important to know each other, understand what timing that you're feeding the animals, how you want to feed uh, the same way. Ensure that you don't leave food in sharp tins. We also see a lot of people, um, a lot of animals that require our community animal clinics help after that because they either suffocate in a plastic bag or they're actually injured because of the sharp tins that the food is left in. The second issue that I'd like to share about is actually about glue traps and also, you know, extending the conversation a bit more to poisoning as well. Uh, so Ander and Jocelyn had shared some of these common methods that are used in, uh, you know, managing animal populations. Uh, unfortunately, they have very big repercussions on other animals as well. So let's take, for example, glue traps. Uh, glue traps are often used to, you know, control rodent populations and sometimes urban bird populations as well. I mean, I'm happy to see that, you know, the, there's a reduction in the way that glue traps are used but often we have some weeks that we can see about three to four cases of glue traps and these are community animals like your cat so you can see the pictures above you notice that also um, smaller animals like kittens are most likely to get trapped in these glue traps uh, what happens is actually a chunk of your fur chunk of the skin can actually be trapped and a lot of them sometimes need to be put down also because there is no way to help them. There's also extreme dehydration, um, you know, and a lot of distress that they, they face when they want to, you know, get out of the trap. Uh, 
on the lower pictures, you will see other animals, uh, you know, like snakes and owls also being uh, impacted because of glue traps. Uh, so these traps are used because they're very affordable, you know, and uh, pest control companies often think that, you know, they'll be the most effective way for us to remove rodents. But I just want to highlight that the real focus should be on addressing the root issue, uh, which is how we are leaving open sources of food, how we're actually managing our waste, and whether you know, we can actually look at more humane ways of preventing these animals to come into our living spaces to begin with. So I know that today is really focused on you know, constructive solutions moving forward, right? So I think we need to think about what we can do as individuals as well to you know, uh, really help address some of these issues. I think, number one, it's to be more vigilant, you know, um, Whichever estate that we live in, there are actually different animal population control measures. Uh, as a resident, uh, you have the right to know what are these measures. Uh, if you notice that there are inhumane measures being in your estate, uh, for example, you see glue traps in the area, or you, you know, believe that there's still culling measures or there's poison being used, uh, you have the right to write into your authorities, such as your town council, or even speak to the pest control companies within your vicinity, or write into your member of parliament to express your views and you know, steadily state to them that you know, I am against such measures. And, you know, that there's actually research that backs up and shows that, you know, there are better, more effective methods that we can use. The second is also to educate the people around you. If you see people feeding wildlife, you know, you should educate them on the perils of such feeding. It's also important to tell them that your actions are not actually helping these animals uh, to thrive. Um, in, in fact, it causes them a lot more danger as well. If you see acts of irresponsible community animal feeding and they you know, do not wish to facilitate a conversation with you, then speak to the authorities such as you know, SPCA and ACRES or even to your town councils to see how we can actually educate them and advise them to you know, uh, avoid such measures. More importantly, also, you know, if you have neighbours who are facing some problems with pigeons coming into their icon ledgers or, you know, their droppings in their, their clothes, uh, it's important to share with them other measures that they can use. For example, you know, should it be about putting netting? Should it be meshing some of your windows or your areas so that these birds cannot actually access their spaces as well? Uh, so these are just some of the measures and I think today, you know, we really want to focus on hearing from you as well on, you know, what are your thoughts, what you have observed around your areas and what are more effective ways that we can actually help our animals coexist in a safe and accessible environment for everyone. All right, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Aarti, for really sharing on the complexity of an urban ecosystem that also accommodates community animals and on responsible uh, feeding of community animals as well. Uh, thanks a lot. And now we have the next uh, speaker, a very interesting uh, sharing session from um, Tong Wei. Um, we had, like we shared earlier yesterday at the pre-forum workshop, we had five exciting teams who actually presented and uh, Tong Wei is from team three, who is a winning team with the ideas. Um, a very interesting, exciting educational campaign idea that uh, the team came up with uh, through stories, games and educational materials. So thanks a lot Tong Wei for making time today uh, to share and uh, welcome. Actually, hello everyone. Um, I'm Tong Yue, one of the participants of the Urban Board Forum workshop conducted yesterday. And I'll be sharing with you what I have learned during the workshop yesterday. Okay, um, next slide. So firstly, a summary of yesterday's workshop. Through yesterday's workshop, I've learned so much about the current measures and common issues related to urban bird management in Singapore. This include learning about the negative impacts of glue traps and poison as an urban bird management measure. During the workshop, we also went into um, breakout rooms and discussed about the management measures and also brainstormed ideas to raise awareness on urban bird management. Okay, um, next slide. So for our group, we took inspiration from the Dengue Alert signboards. So the signboard will be in different colors where green will be no human bird conflict and orange and red will be that more management measures need to be done. Um, our second idea is targeted at kids. Since kids are rather impressionable, so it will be relatively easier to change their mindset on coexistence with urban birds. So this idea involves a small book or infographic in the form of a cartoon or comic that could be used to teach them about the various urban bird management measures. This could also include the negative impacts of glue trap and poisons on birds. Okay, next slide. 
So this further illustrates our two ideas. Um, so the one on the left is the Dengue signboard one. So um, there's different colors, the green, red, yellow, and red. So it shows different um, level of conflict of human bird conflict. Um, and the one on the right would be the infographic signboards sort kids. So um, we could also include real life pictures and names of the birds and allow the kids to learn about the urban bird management ish, uh, ur bird urban management in the form of a story. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I will also like to share some other ideas proposed during yesterday's workshop. So the first idea targets at the elderly. So since through our research and some survey, it was found that elderly often get bored and lonely. So they resort to feeding urban birds as a pastime. Therefore, in response to this, a community pet could be kept and elderly can take turns to take care of it. Alternatively, animal rescue could allow elderly to volunteer with or interact with the animals. The second idea is to create an interactive game. So this game could be created through a case competition, and this game could take on a perspective of birds providing feeding and non-feeding scenarios. It could also mimic the life of a bird, including feeding patterns and behavior, residents' reactions, and how they go about their daily life. This could reinforce the message of not feeding and how this may impact the bird's behavior and encourage it to find its food on its own. Moreover, it could also act as a system that encourages people to report findings of urban bird congregation via a point system. The last idea would be a tray return modification. An enclosed room area for tray return could be created with netting. The frequency of plates cleared in these stations should also be increased. This will prevent birds from feeding from leftover food and create a space where human and bird can coexist. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Tongwei. I think it is such a well-organized uh, presentation, considering you know you your team and uh, the team's brainstorm just yesterday, and you uh, came up with this presentation. So uh, thanks so much. And also, uh, we saw a comment uh, from Bibi Sun saying, "Great ideas, very creative. Well done to you and your team members." So. Uh, we, uh, you know, we totally agree, and uh, we have the same comments as well. And we hope you, your team, will also be the pioneering members of the Urban Bird Ambassadors uh, that's going to be coming up. So thanks a lot, and we will stay in touch. And I would like to uh, introduce and welcome our next uh, speaker, uh, Nurin. Uh, Nurin is a recent graduate from Nian Polytechnic. Uh, she was part of a team that participated in the civic interns program organized by the Nian Polytechnic earlier this year, for which ACUS was a partner organization. As part of the project, Noreen and her team conducted an engagement session at the Nisun East to raise awareness about pigeon feeding to the residents. It takes a lot of courage to approach uh, just members of public and uh, talk about issues related to, it may sound very random to uh, these residents, but they actually approached and spoke and engaged with them. So um, uh, welcome Noreen, I would love to hear uh, about your sharing and how the project went. We'll just keep a moment while uh, Noreen starts sharing. And uh, Akers and SPC, I think I can speak for both of us how excited we are to have the youth on board um, on such important issues. And we really look forward to working with you all and even the team of interns who are working behind the scenes now. All yours, Noreen. Mm, okay, testing mic one, two. I hope you guys can hear me well because I've um I've got feedback that sometimes um it doesn't um you cannot hear me that well. Um so how's my slide? I hope all is good. Oh good, thank you. Okay, so uh let me begin by um thanking Ambu and 
um, ICRS and SPCA um, for having this panel. It's my pleasure to be here to learn from um, others passionate about the course. So again, I'm Nurin. I'll be presenting. Um, I'll be representing my team of civic interns uh, from Nian Poly. And in the next 15 to 15 minutes, I'll be sharing the engagement project we carried um, out back in June. Okay. So here's my team. Um, so basically, um, let me just introduce to you what civic internship is. Um, so in Nian Poly, you have three choices of, um, of internship, um, three paths of internship of choices. So um, we pick civic internship um, path where we collab uh, we, we intern under organizations that are listed as um, NGOs, non um, government organizations or social uh, nonprofit organization or social enterprises. So students like um, us um, were intern at a socially responsible workplace to apply and learn the skills um, that we have learned in school. So rest assured, my team um, is full of group of humans uh, who are very loving and care for society. Yeah. So how did we begin? So at the end of our internship, uh, we actually met up with ICRS um, and we presented an issue that they were facing. So we, um, the problem statement was that how might we effectively engage seniors, pigeons, feeders, and in order to end the um, feeding practice, which um, both SPCA and ICRS have shared um, why it's very important. 